Hey, welcome to Life in the Leadership Lane. I'm your host, Bruce Waller, where I get to talk to leaders that are making a difference in the workplace and in our community. What did they do to get started? And what are they doing today there? Today, I have another special guest. Her name is Brenda Siri. She is the senior level global talent acquisition leader. She's, oh my gosh, you are going to love this show today because she's going to be talking leadership. She's going to be talking recruiting and a whole lot more. Brenda, I'm so excited to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Well, you know, I always like to reflect when I met my guests and we've known each other for a while now. And, and we actually were introduced by a mutual friend, Kate. Yes. And, uh, she's amazing, isn't she? She's wonderful. I've worked with her for a number of years. So yes, and I'm thrilled that she connected us as well. Absolutely. We're talking about uh, CHRO Kate Blingyal, and she's absolutely uh, amazing as well. I need to get her on the show uh, yes, when the time is right as well. Hey, I wanted to bring you on the show today because I want to talk about s- just some of the amazing things you've done in your career when it comes to talent acquisition. And one of the things I know, one of the things I really enjoy doing is I like to look at LinkedIn profiles and, and do my research. And one of the things I noticed about you, and I wanted to ask you about this to kind of kick things off is, I noticed that you were a recipient of a Recruiting Talent Acquisition Professional of the Year Award by Pillar World Awards back in, it looks like 2018. And when someone gets an award like that, I'm like, I want to know a little bit more about that. What was that like? And and why did you receive that award? So um, the company that I worked for at the time, we were going through some very aggressive growth and hiring measures. And um, this particular organization does award companies, um, awards in in a variety of areas. And and the company had put themselves out there for a number of awards. And I, in particular, was given this award. And it was really quite an honor for me because um, the second place winner was Tata Agency, which is a huge global organization. So it was really an honor to uh, to know that my efforts really had exceeded someone that does such you know large scale global recruiting and talent acquisition, and my award was specifically for leadership, which is also something that I'm really really proud of, um, because I think uh, leadership is you know it's such an important role in individuals' careers. Um, not just for myself, but for the people that I lead. And so knowing that I had done something well enough to receive, you know, such a a wonderful award was very exciting for me in my career. And as a matter of fact, talking about Kate, uh, she also won an award that same year for being, you know, the outstanding leader of a human resources team. So we had a really great year that year. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. I know she's also been uh, Dallas HR Executive of the Year as well. And so that is fantastic. That is like, that's a really special because I always talk about how we don't do things to be recognized, but it's so nice to recognize the people that are making impact in, in whatever they do. And so I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you talking about leadership here because we are on life in the leadership lane and we're going to talk about leadership. As you said that, I, I also appreciate how you shared um, it, it's really for for others because you know when I talk about leadership, a lot of times you know I say, hey, you know, why does leadership matter? You know, and I, then I'll go to, well, do you remember when you had a a, a leader that really mm-hmm. inspired you and how that sure. made you feel? Yes. And do you remember having a leader that didn't inspire you and how that felt? And that's why that matters, right? Absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. Oh my goodness! Hey, well, I want to start off the show with the Brenda Siri story. Um, and I know a little bit about you, but I would love to know, like, where did you grow up and how in the world did you get into leadership and, and talent acquisition? Sure. Well, I grew up in California. I was born in the San Francisco Bay Area and lived a good majority of my life there. Um, I did move to San Diego with my family at a later time, then back to the Bay Area. And then before I left California, I was back in San Diego and um, had an opportunity to relocate to the Dallas, Texas area with my family and go to work for Citigroup, Mm. um, which is a fantastic company to work for and worked there for a number of years. Um, but my my TA leadership began back in the 90s um, when I worked for a company in California, 
and was in HR and sort of fell into talent acquisition back in the good old days. I hate to age myself, <laughs> but truthfully, back in the days when some of your, uh, your sourcing or looking for the right candidates was either through the newspaper or this really cool new tool called Monster. <laughs> yes. So, um, yes. And so, um, you know, that was kind of where my leader and talent, uh, my beginning of talent acquisition career started um, and, you know, became a leadership role from there. I think it's just always been kind of a natural knack for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I love people. I love communicating with people. Um, and it, it just was a great opportunity for me to hone natural skills that I had as a leader um, and find amazing talent. Today, there are still people that work at that company that I recruited into that company 20 years ago, and they still talk with me and stay in touch. So uh, it, it was just a natural fit for me. Yeah, that's got to be very fulfilling. I, I got to tell you, uh, San Diego, I just got back from San Diego. My brother lives there. I love San Diego. I love the weather. It's 70 when you wake up, 70 in the afternoon and 70 at night. It's just amazing. Hey, well, uh, let me uh, let me ask you this. You know, anytime I, I talk to high performers such as yourself on the show, they seem to have something in common. That is, they talk about people that have helped them on their journey. We call them mentors. And I was just curious, like you, like you have, uh, you know, you, you have really, um, well, you're in a high level position, right? And so mm -hmm. you didn't just start there. No. Yeah. I mean, you started from the ground floor. Were there any mentors that helped you along the way? And, and, and if there were, what was some of the traits or some of the things they did for you that, that helped you? Would you mind sharing that? Thinking back early in my career, I worked for a gentleman in California. Mm -hmm. He was just a very no-nonsense gentleman, you know, really ran a tight ship. He was a very formal gentleman. He had been raised in Chicago. His father was one of, I can't remember his name, but he was one of the most well-known architects in Chicago, had built a lot of the downtown area and he had grown up under his father's leadership and he was just um, very sure of that type of leadership and carried it into his own business and was a tremendous mentor for me and gave me some great advice that I will share later in the podcast with you that has always stuck with me. Um, and I remember reaching back out to him probably 10 years after I had worked for him looking for a reference for a job when I was going to go work at a new company. And his reference was so kind. You know, he, he made a statement that I've never forgotten that was along the lines of the fact that I should be in a leadership position because I can... I could relate to other leaders in the organization the same way I could relate to the entry level people or in the organization that I was a very, you know, well rounded leader and person and, and it meant a lot to me. Um, probably another one of my um, biggest advocates and mentors in my HR career here in Dallas has been Kate Lingell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's got a lot of leadership experience and she uh, has really shown me some tremendous skills that have helped me in the industry. And she also was super supportive when I decided at one point late in my career to go get an MBA and um, always supported me through that. So I really appreciate that. And probably my greatest mentor of all is my husband. Ah. Uh, he had a very illustrious 45 year career with Citigroup himself. Has just always been, you know, someone that if I, if I needed professional advice, I would go to him and talk with him about it. Um, when I was getting my MBA, he was my proofreader on all my papers. So, you know, I think I've had, you know, I've been really blessed with some really great mentors in my career. Well, I appreciate you sharing all of that. I, I can't wait to hear the, uh, some of the advice that uh, one of your mentors shared. But, I, you know, when someone talks about their spouse being a mentor, I always talk about my wife being a great mentor for me and, and sharing different perspective. I just, 
I find there's a lot of, um, I don't know, fulfillment in that because, you know, you're bringing everyone into everything that you do, right? It's not Mm -hmm. separating work from home. It's like, this is part of who I am. And so I appreciate you sharing that. Oh, I want to ask you this, you know, you're, you're, man, you are uh, very experienced in what you do. And I always like to ask the question around, you know, I wrote uh, the book called Find Your Lane a few years ago, and that's really about finding your purpose, your calling, right, in your career. So I, I always like to ask it, was there a moment when you found your lane, you said, I really love what I do, or, or were there moments? You know, I think that leadership doesn't start when you have a career. Leadership starts much earlier in life, right? And I think that Uh, throughout my education, you know, uh, educational career, even in high school, you know, I I found leadership in a variety of ways. I, I was asked to be a tutor, uh, a math tutor to students when I was in high school. I, um, you know, which was kind of my first step at feeling a little bit of leadership. I later cliche, people may laugh at me, I was a cheerleader, and then I was eventually the head cheerleader, right? And so I think that leadership, you know, you go through different phases of finding where you're supposed to be as a leader. When I really got to a point in my career where I recognized that I really had a knack for it was during my time at Citigroup because Mm -hmm. my personality is, you know, I'm, I'm more of a servant leader. I have a, you know, very much of a servant's heart and having the opportunity to, to work with such a diverse workforce. I worked with people in other countries as well as in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, I was able to find that my leadership skills worked across the board, no matter who I was working with, in what country, different customs, different personalities, that um, for me, being true to myself, being someone with high morals and integrity, um, and that servant leadership style really was the point where I said, this is something I'm good at. Mm. I need to continue pursuing this. I love you know, that. I think the the other thing to me is that the knowledge that I have gained throughout my career, um, you know, it's important to share that knowledge. I, I shouldn't just hoard it all for myself, right? I, I hope one day to retire and mm-hmm. be doing something different. And um, so along the way, I need to be mentoring the people that are working alongside me, teaching them what I know, learning mm-hmm. things from them. Uh, leadership is not just all about what you know and what you tell others to do because others can teach you as well. Go so, on. yeah, I, I love mentoring people and, and, you know, supporting others in their growth as well. I love that perspective. Cause you're talking about, Hey, I don't, I, I may not have all the answers. I'm always open to hearing perspective and what other people think so we can go together. Uh, mm-hmm. That is fantastic. Well, we're talking leadership here. I, I would like to kind of move over to recruiting a little bit. I mean, man, what a time we're in. What, what do you enjoy most about recruiting though? It's one of the greatest parts of, of working in the industry, right? I mean, you get to help people find their next best role. Mm. And, you know, part of that is Uh, there's a thrill in sourcing and digging for the right person to fit the role that you're working on. Um, There's a a lot of enjoyment in knowing that somebody is looking for the right opportunity and you've been part of that. Um, You have to be very, very excited about the company that you work for. Mm -hmm. You know, I always tell the people that work with me, your salespeople, your recruiters, but you're really salespeople. And your mm. role is to sell the why. And especially in a competitive market, right? Why does your candidate want to work for our company mm. versus going down the street to another company that is offering them the same role? Maybe they're offering a little bit more money, but maybe there is something different about our company that is going to set us apart from those folks down the street. So you've really got to believe in the product that you're Mm. supporting, the company that you work for, because that's when you're going to sell the why. Mm. And that's super important in this industry. 
You said something that uh, really strikes me. People that I, I feel like high performers, they, they have this belief about them, right? Mm -hmm. They believe in what they do, but they believe in their team. They believe in the cause and everything they do. And where does that come from? Because I heard you mention earlier that somebody spoke belief into you, uh, one of your mentors that said, hey, you're a leader. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love to know, like, where does that come for you, from you or belief? I think that when when anyone is going out looking for an opportunity for the right job for them you have to be looking first not for money mm. not for a job title but for something you can believe in mm. you have to be true to yourself and i think a lot of people you know we've seen ebbs and flows in in talent over the course of the past 10 years right you've had markets where it's all you know, just like in housing, right? Buyer sellers market. Is it the mm. candidates market or the company's market? And when you get into those candidate market phases, people are like, I'm going to go look for a new job because everybody's <laughs> going to pay me more if I go right. somewhere else. Right. And I really think that, yes, of course, we all want to make the most money we can make because, you know, we have bills to pay and, and yeah. there's a lot of personal satisfaction that comes from your income. But also believing in the company that you work for and mm -hmm. their purpose and their mission and what they do is what's really, truly going to keep you happy in a job. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe in the product, if you don't believe in the company's mission, I just don't see that you're going to have long-term employment with someone. So mm -hmm. I think that's so important when a person is looking for the right opportunity is look for something that you can believe in. I love that. I uh, just got through publishing my book, Life in the Leadership Lane, and speaking belief was one of the chapters. And I just feel like uh, that is so like, that is just, it, it's just, it's just bigger. It, it, mm -hmm. It's just a bigger conversation. It, it's a bigger in everything you do. And <laughs> whenever you're attracting or recruiting, I guess, if you will, if you don't believe it's going to be hard to sell, you know, yeah. do everything you've talked about, right? Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you that I work for a company where my boss, he just believed in me. And I've been there now for 18 years because wow. I believe in the company. I believe mm -hmm. in uh, our principles. I believe in everything that we do. And so I think that whenever you uh, are able to instill that people, I don't know, they're just attracted to that. They want to feel like they're believed in. Absolutely. I agree 100 percent. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you this. So you, you know, you have led as a leader these these recruiting teams in different different companies. I, I always like to ask the question around a high performing team. Like what is like when you have a high performing team, what is that? You know, what are some of the traits that you see from some of the high performing teams that you've been a part of? Uh, collaboration mm. is huge. Um, they need to uh, have a strong sense of belonging to the team, to each other, and know that I'm their partner. I mm. never would ever consider introducing someone who works for me through a reporting structure as someone who works for me. They would all tell you, I always introduce them as, as someone I work with. Right. I believe a successful team is one where the leader and every member of that team collaborates and works well together, that we're all working for the same mission, you know, to bring in the best of the best talent. Um, I think that a strong team is one that's filled with camaraderie. You know, if we believe that we're all in it together, I think that you will find that everyone has a higher level of support for each other. So that we owe, you know, we overall want to see the success of everyone on that team. I've seen teams that did not have that kind of camaraderie and support mm -hmm. and it failed miserably, mm -hmm. you know, so I think it's really, really important. I also think that from a talent standpoint, um, one of the things that is so important is that they each understand their role. You know, they are the mm. first introduction for anyone coming into the company, right? So uh, any candidate who is highly skilled, who is looking at an employer, 
the first person they're going to meet is someone from the hiring team. They're going to meet that, you know, that talent acquisition specialist or recruiter. And um, if they don't have a good experience in the very beginning, they may never find their way in the door and the company could have really lost incredible talent. Mm -hmm. So building a team that understands the magnitude of their role uh, in the organization is huge. And then making sure that once that candidate makes it into the organization, that they have a best in class experience in onboarding, in training, and in, in mm -hmm. understanding once they're in the door what their role is going to be so that they feel inclusivity with the team that they join. So I think that, um, you know, it's really important to foster an, you know, an environment where the team understands what it takes to be the very best impression to our future employees. I, oh, that's so good. I, I love how you started out with, it. you know, it's about understanding uh, your role and, and I think about setting the expectations, right? Being clear on, hey, here's your role, here's what we're all about. But the, the word that really comes to mind as you shared that was belonging. Mm -hmm. Sense of belonging. I think, I feel like more people are wanting that. Absolutely. Do you, do you see that whenever you're like recruiting and candidates, you sense that it may not be the money they're wanting. They just want to feel like they belong somewhere. Absolutely. And, you know, our future leaders, you know, are the millennials and the Gen Zs right now, right, that are coming up through the workforce. And a lot of studies have shown that, you know, of course, um, you know, income is important, but overall total rewards, you know, including culture and diversity. And even, believe it or not, they're looking very closely at retirement plans and thinking about their future, which is fantastic, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think that coming into an organization, if that sense of belonging isn't set up for them from the get-go, it's really a recipe for disaster. Thinking of things like, um, I mean, I've seen engagement surveys done okay. where a new employee in the first three months doesn't feel that sense of belonging. They're not getting support from a leader. They're not getting support from their peers. And so, you know, some of the things that I have done in a couple of different organizations is set up, you know, a peer based buddy type of program, right? Someone that they can pair up with who's you know, maybe a natural leader in within the team that they work on that can help build that bond and that sense of belonging that is needed to help create that long term engagement with any new employee. OK, if you're listening right now, you need to be taking notes. I mm -hmm. love all this. A peer based buddy program. I mm -hmm. love that to give them like a sense of, hey, you know what? We care here. We value you. We right. want you to feel like you belong setting something like that. That's fantastic. Sure. And I mean, you know, you think about every organization has a, they have a different culture. They have a different mindset. Some may have very specific disciplines that are part of the core culture of the organization that may be a little difficult for someone coming from somewhere else to grasp or to understand. And if you've got someone who's worked there for a number of years, they can share that knowledge and help people understand, hey, this is part of our foundation in this company. This is, you know, understanding this is going to help you succeed. That's huge, you know, to, to give that to someone through a peer and a bond. And especially, you know, nowadays, a lot of companies started this pandemic with a very, we'll go virtual short term. And in a few months, we'll all get back into the office and be together again. And we're not there yet. There's mm -hmm. now there are many companies that are saying, why pay real estate prices for a building when we're being very successful remotely? And the idea of a new hire coming into a company and feeling a sense of belonging by video is very, very difficult. So having a mentor type program, mm -hmm. a buddy type program to help people acclimate if this is going to be the way they're going to work with the company is super important because you don't get that that, uh, you know, in person, hey, how was your weekend when you walk in the office or 
hear about someone's family or things that, you know, where are they going to lunch? I'll go with you. You know, it's just, it's changed. So I really do believe that successful onboarding absolutely must include, you know, a, a partnership, if it were, or a bonding program for new employees and people who are part of the team that they're joining. That is, oh my goodness, that is fantastic. Hey, I, w- I want to ask you this question as, as you're sitting there talking about this. Has, you know, we we all have heard, you know, I mean, we, we're seeing the unemployment rate, we're seeing the jobs that are needed, you know, is a candidate driven market. Uh, you know, any thoughts around, like, have you changed your approach uh, as a leader on how you recruit, whether it's an employer driven market or a candidate driven market? Are there any different like approaches you take or are you driving things the, the same way? I drive things the same way mm-hmm. because really my goal in helping any company acquire great talent is to go after the best person for that mm-hmm. role, right? It's it's um, It shouldn't be any different in whatever kind of market it is. I should always be looking for the best of the best. You know, it, it drives change in the other direction at times, right? Because you have these super highly qualified people who are like, look, I can come work for you for X amount of dollars, but I can go get a job over there for $50,000 more. Then it changes because you do have to look at the budget of the company. You have to look at what financially makes sense. And while, you know, that particular person being able to get a role somewhere else for $50,000 more might make sense for that company, it may not make sense for yours. And so, you know, attracting talent isn't just about attracting them any cost. It's, you know, again, it's partly attracting someone who sees the mission and the vision of the company as well. Oh, man. I love how you, how you talk about the, uh, the mission, the vision uh, of the organization and how important that is. Hey, I want to ask you this. You're a very, I can just like feel it through the screen. Here. You're a very driven leader. What, what, like what drives you every day? That's a great question. Part of it is, um, you know, truly I, I love people. Mm. I have so much respect for the amazing team that I have built Um, today and in the past. uh, I have some tremendously talented people working for me and with me that understand their role and just go out and find the most phenomenal in the talent world. We call them purple squirrels, just those very, you know, unique uh, people to have join your team. But I think um, part of it is that, you know, I am someone who acts with high levels of integrity. Mm -hmm. Um, I really stick to my morals and I really respect myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps drive my success because at the end of the day, I don't look back and think, shouldn't have done that. That wasn't right. I can always feel good at the end of the day about my actions, who I interacted with, how I treated them, because you know, having respect for yourself is a huge part of, of being driven to be a great leader and to be successful. Okay. I've, I've just got to pause there just for one second and just soak <laughs> that in. When you talk about having respect for yourself, I think that's so important. I know there's people listening, people watching right now going, I needed that. I needed to hear that because, you know, we all, we all have failure, right? We all have different yeah. things where we're trying to achieve more or do something different but when but at the end of the day when we give our best we just need to have respect for who we mm-hmm. are and, and what we do and i love how you talk about the importance of values hey i want, I want to shift over to just another area. i just got back from sherm national and one of the things i hear and i just i've been hearing this for a long time but it just seems to be like right now there's a spotlight on the employee experience and I also just got through interviewing a, a wonderful leader that talked about the candidate experience. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the employee experience. When it comes to recruiting, um, what, is, what does that mean to you, your team, about delivering an employee experience? And how important is that? Oh, it's hugely important. One of the biggest mistakes that I've ever seen happen in the recruiting industry is people interview for a job and they don't hear anything. 
Mm. There's nothing worse than the sound of crickets, right? We want to know. Candidates want to know. You had an interview two days ago. Somebody should get back to you and let you know, hey, mm. things went well. Things didn't go well. They didn't think you were the right fit. We'd love to keep your information uh, you know, in our files and reach back out to you because believe it or not, I think a lot of people think that that is actually just a cliche statement and it's not because applicant tracking systems do retain that information. Mm -hmm. And there could be a point where we could say we're looking for someone with a different skill set, go into that applicant tracking system, search current candidates for that skill set and that same person you rejected mm. might come up for that role. So I hope people won't take that as a cliche statement uh, because it is, it, it is something that happens on a daily basis. Mm. We do retain information on candidates and certainly hope the best for those that we can't bring into the company, but not letting someone know when they're in a process where they're at is horrible for the candidate experience. Candidates yeah. deserve to know. They absolutely deserve to know. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, the beginning step. I think um, feedback is important for them as mm -hmm. well. People like to know why, why, why wasn't I selected? And so if a company is setting up an applicant tracking system and mm -hmm. creating, um, a, for lack of a better term, rejection, emails to go to candidates, you know, be empathetic when you create those emails, create an email that gives them some level of explanation that thanks them for believing enough in your company to apply to a job in your company, you know, feel honored that they mm. did do that, you know? So I think it's really important for the candidate experience to, to, to give them a clear answer, mm -hmm. um, you know, as clear as you can in a legal sense, obviously you also have to look at HR laws, but as clearly as you can and as kindly as you can, let someone know that you appreciate that they thought of you, your company, and um, would definitely keep them in mind for other opportunities that they would be a right fit for. I love that. I think that, you know, earlier when you talked about high performing teams, you talked about setting expectations. And I would think that would be one of those, you know, because I hear, you know, through, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's um, different communities that I'm part of about, you know, these candidates that have been, you know, the term is ghosted. Right. I've been right. ghosted. And I'm right. like, what does that even mean? Why would somebody <laughs> even do that? But I think part of that is because they don't, they're not on a team that has set the expectations. Here's how mm -hmm. we ought to operate. And they just don't think about that being important. And as you talk about that, I think that's what sets apart higher performers when they see the, the, the importance of that. And then this word, I just, I keep hearing this word too, empathy. Yes. That's so key, isn't it? It is. It absolutely is. Um, you know, I, you don't know on the other end of that job application, if that person desperately needed that job mm. or just was looking for more money. But, you know, empathy is so important because you don't always know the circumstances as just why someone applied. And, and um, I always want a candidate to be left with a positive experience, you know? And, and you're right, setting, setting the threshold with your team and making sure that they understand that communication with any candidate, including internal candidates, mm. is very, very important because not everyone who applies to an open role in your company is from the outside. You also have people on the inside who are looking for the opportunity to grow with the company. And so it's very important to communicate with internal employees as well. I mean, what better potential employee do you have than someone who's already committed to the company and believes in the company mm. and wants so much to grow with the company? However, there are times when you have people who are internal, who apply to roles, who don't meet the, the requirements of the role. And so they would not be the right candidate. And again, Empathy is huge at that point, mm. right? You want to make sure that you explain why you should engage hiring managers to mm. say, hey, um, person X really wants this role on your team. 
they're not qualified for it, but would you take some time to talk with them? Give them some mm -hmm. tips. What could they do? Could they go study? Are there certifications or training they could get? Is there someone on your team who might be able to mentor them and work with them and give them an opportunity? There's just so many things a company can do to give both internal and external candidates a great experience. This is, I, I'm going to tell you right now, there are people right now taking notes on this. This is so great because when I think about this, I think about, you know, this is what great companies do. They have all this communication. I didn't even think about the internal candidate as I'm sitting here talking about, and here you are saying, hey, don't forget about the, the important internal, right? No, right. The, 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 the internal is just as important as the external uh, when it comes to that. Hey, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, for internal or external. There's people right now that are, you know what, they're looking for their next. They're thinking, hey, I, you know, I, I, I want to try to get myself in position. Any thoughts around uh, what maybe a, a tip or, or some tips that candidates might do to get better in position uh, when it comes to landing their next role? Any thoughts around that? My biggest one. <laughs> I um, I spoke uh, at a at a large university a few months ago, and when I gave this advice to these students that were about to graduate, I can't tell you the number of them that come running to the front of the room <laughs> to talk to me about it. I said to them, and I would say it to anyone, don't overcomplicate your resume by going mm. out and finding some fancy template. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of of soon to be graduating students or recently graduated students. And then I've seen it even in, you know, well-tenured experienced people go out and find these fancy resume formats on Word or, you know, some other uh, uh, company, you know, that provides templates. Mm -hmm. And those templates don't always feed into an applicant tracking system. And an applicant tracking system is that place where you go when you apply for a job and you answer several questions and you upload your resume as you're applying for a job, your resume is feeding into that company's applicant tracking system. And if it's too fancy, if it's overcomplicated, if it has pictures, if it has um, you know, symbols that may not easily be read, it won't feed in properly to the system. Mm -hmm. It won't parse right. And it could move your resume into um, a, a part of an ATS system that it gets overlooked. So if you want your resume to be seen, keep it clean, mm. keep it simple, make it clear, um, but make sure that it doesn't have a formatting that won't feed right into a company's applicant tracking system because you may be overlooked for a job that you'd be perfect for. Those are some really, really important. Yeah, those are some great tips. I, I uh, appreciate you sharing that because I've heard uh, people say, hey, should I put a picture on a resume? Should a resume be more than two pages? You know, they there's a lot of people that have a lot of questions around that. And what you're saying is, hey, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just keep it clean. Keep it simple so that the formatting will feed into that ATS system. Yeah. I mean, some other advice I have is don't be afraid to network. Don't be afraid mm. to connect with people's people that you know at companies that you apply to or reach out to someone that you may be connected with on LinkedIn who already works at a company that you'd be interested in going to work for or you notice, hey, Brenda Siri is connected to Bruce and Bruce knows Bob and Bob works at Microsoft and that's my dream company. You know, don't be afraid to, to reach out to your network. And also don't be afraid to um, take your resume and almost copy the highlights from each company that are in your resume straight onto LinkedIn so that people can can search for you when it, when a talent acquisition professional is looking for the right candidate, they're going out and putting in keywords from a job description and saying, I need someone who knows how to do this or who has done this or has this skill. And if it is not on your LinkedIn, again, you may be overlooked for a fantastic opportunity. 
Such great uh, tips there. And I know that people are taking notes right now. This is so great. So great. Oh, man. And I told you the time is going to fly by. Uh, yes. And I do want to I want to I want to ask you uh, a question. And actually, you mentioned you had some advice earlier. I'm not sure if it's this, but I always like to ask, is there any advice you've been given during your career that it was just so good you just find yourself sharing with others? Yes, all the time. And it is that very piece of information that same gentleman that I worked for in San Diego a number of years ago, you, you've been there, you know, it's, yep. it's a beach town. It's a fairly casual place, right? And we were expected five days a week to go into the office fully dressed up. Hmm. Women in a beach town were required to wear pantyhose with dresses <laughs> and at least knee highs with slacks. And I remember talking to him one day and saying, do you think maybe we could just try casual Fridays? Let, you know, let's come in in jeans. And of course, nothing provocative, but, you know, business casual attire. And he looked me in the face and he said, absolutely not. And I'm like, but we live by the beach, you know? He said, no, he said, let me tell you something. This is advice my father always gave me. I've carried it with me into my business that I own and it has proven successful for me. And if you take this, it will prove successful for you. I said, what? He said, you have to dress for success. You have to dress for the job that you want. Not four days a week, five days a week. He said, if you get up and you get dressed for the job that you want or the, you know, a leadership role, you're going to be successful. And it has really stuck with me. And I will tell you, I have worked at companies where they were very business casual and I was still very dressed up. And I've had people ask me, why? Why can't you just throw on a pair of jeans and come to the office? I can't do it. It, it he was right. It changes my mentality and my drive and the way I perform on a daily basis. And even with the pandemic, I tried. I'm not kidding you. I really tried, Bruce. First couple of days, I tried yoga pants on the bottom and a nice <laughs> shirt on the top. And I couldn't do it. I felt like half successful, you know? Yeah. And so every day I am dressed in slacks or a skirt or a dress. I still wear heels. Like I'm, I dress every day, like I'm going to the office and I really, it, it is a mindset. And so I do share that with people when they ask about it, because you just wouldn't believe how much of a difference it makes in the way that you perform your role on a daily basis. Oh, my goodness. Dress for success. I just wrote that down. That is fantastic. <laughs> you know, I um, when I go to events, I'm always wearing a sports coat. I just mm -hmm. I can't. It's hard for me to just go in a golf shirt. Right. I just I mean, it's just it's just who you know, I think it's it, it really is true. Uh, I always talk about it. it's not the things you want to achieve. It's the person you want to be. You just have to decide who do you want to be. Right. right. That is great. Great advice. I love that. I appreciate you sharing that, Brenda. This has been so much fun. I so much yeah, fun. It is so much fun. Hey, we're going to shift to the last part of the show. It's called it's time to accelerate. I'm just going to ask you a few fun questions as we uh, as we wrap up here. First question I always like to ask is, would you rather read a book or listen to an audible or a podcast? I would probably, ugh, it really depends. <laughs> I, I, um, I love to read. I just don't have a lot of time for it. And mm. so a podcast is nice because I can do that while I'm trying to do other things. So I would probably say more of a podcast. Plus with a podcast, you can really select that area of interest mm. for yourself, right? There are so many wonderful podcasts out there, whether it's something for professional development or mysteries to listen to. There's, there's a lot of great options out there for folks. So I'd say oh, I, love I love that. And by the way, crime and mystery is one of the, <laughs> one of the most popular when people say uh, they listen to podcasts, I'm like, oh man, uh, but that's <laughs> great. I love how you talk about, you just like, I always talk about it's some of the best free coaching you can get in your career, uh, whatever you decide to listen to. Hey, well, right. let me ask you this, Brenda, other than work, because I know you work a lot, other than work, like what really energizes you outside of work? 
Um, my family is just huge to me. I uh, have been married to my best friend and my greatest support system in everything mm. that I do for 15 years mm. and um, couldn't have asked for a, a better partner in life. You know, my, my children are amazing as well. It's so much fun watching them grow into their success and into their own families as they're grown and out of the house. And I'm living the empty nester life, but, uh, you know, I think that those are probably, you know, my greatest inspirations, but I'm also really energized by helping others. It's really important to me to give back in a variety of ways, whether it's through philanthropic giving or participating or volunteering, or whether it is mentoring, you know, someone that works with me. I think that um, that's, that's something that gives me a lot of personal satisfaction as well. I would say you are driven to serve, Brenda. That is absolutely fantastic. Hey, I want to ask you this final question. It's my favorite question I like to ask guests on the show. And the question is, Brenda, 10 years older, is knocking at your front door. And okay. you're going to go answer that door. What's she going to tell you? What's she going to tell me? She's going to say, Brenda, job well done. Mm. You did a great job. You were an inspiration to others. Mm. You always held your morals and your integrity above all else in your mm. personal and professional decisions. Mm. And now it's time to uh, sell your house and go buy one <laughs> on the beach and retire. <laughs> That's fantastic. That is a wise 10 year old Brenda Asiri. Brenda, I appreciate you coming onto the show today and just sharing perspective, so much wisdom. Hey, if somebody wants to connect with you, they heard something you talked about, maybe around the buddy program, or maybe some of the tips you shared uh, about the candidate experience. How could, how's the best way for them to connect? They can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if you know the beginning of the LinkedIn uh feed for everyone. I am Brenda Dash Siri. Mm. They can find me at LinkedIn. I also have my phone number and my personal email address there, and they are available for anyone who would like to reach out to me and, and connect with me. I'm happy to be, you know, just a source of support, answer questions, or even, you know, a mentorship, you know, whatever someone needs, I'm here to help. Well, you're definitely driving in the leadership lane. I uh, appreciate you sharing today. So, I mean, I have, I mean, I'm going to hold up right. I have a full page of notes here, <laughs> Brenda. This has been fantastic. I cannot wait to share this conversation. I uh, appreciate, uh, again, appreciate you coming on and just being part of the show. And, and most importantly, I appreciate your friendship. Yes, absolutely. And Bruce, I thank you for trusting me to, uh, you know, to be here and, and help share the information that I do have you know, from my years of experience with your listeners and wish you much continued success. Awesome. I'll talk to you later. I can't wait to share this. Good. Thanks, Bruce.